Today on CityCast DC. It seems like there are weed shops and vape shops and smoke shops on every corner in DC these days. And this might be a bit of an unpopular opinion, but I think it's a bit much. That said, when the city used emergency legislation a few weeks ago to crack down on unlicensed weed shops, I wasn't sure I was on board with that either. DC's weed culture is all so complex. So I sat down with my co-host, Michael Schaefer, to get into how DC's cannabis culture is changing and what it means for the city. Today's Tuesday, March 26th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what DC is talking about. So, Mike, the last time that you and I saw each other in person, we both had the same kind of specific gripe about the city. Do you remember what it was? We are like 99% smell of weed saturated. (laughs) Yes. So I want to talk about it, but I do want to say like right off the top, neither of us is like anti-weed. Obviously, I like to get high. I think we should be legal. I think that the criminal enforcement of weed often obviously disproportionately impacts brown and black people. So like all of that off the top. This is not a we hate weed episode, but I do think it's fair to talk about the ways that D.C.'s relationship to marijuana has really changed the city in some ways for the worse. Totally. And like, look, at same thing. I, I think if like there's a just by all measures, right, there's this, this is a product. It's like social negative consequences or I think like less bad than a bunch of things that are legal fully and have always been legal. And, you know, if there's something a lot of people want to do, the bias should be like, let them do it. All that said, this kind of semi-legal weed culture that is emerging is, I don't know, it's just like sort of janky. And yet there is like sort of as a hangover, I think so much of it is like a hangover from prohibition. And one of the hangovers from prohibition is if you're saying, as you were that day, like, hey, I sometimes don't like it when people smoke weed right under my window, you kind of sound like a Karen when you do, or you sound like some sort of (laughs) drug warrior or something. Yeah, well, actually, that very scenario that you just laid out happened in D.C. So a woman was complaining about the smell of somebody in her building who who was smoking medical marijuana in his apartment, and she took the, the case to court. The judge ruled in her favor and ruled that that person who was smoking medical marijuana and I guess stinking up her apartment had to stop because the smell was creeping into her place and causing a nuisance. And so it obviously is not just you and me saying this, like it's not just you and me who have an issue with the smell. Here is a court being like, yeah, the smell actually as a matter of like legal precedent is obnoxious. Yes. And that's a tough thing because that person was doing something legal within the confines of their own home. Like, that's just what you're supposed to do. That's what the law says you're supposed to do. You know, the other, like, it as part of the conversation about the, uh, about Ted Leonsis wanted to move his teams out of the arena in Chinatown is that the streets around there reek of uh, marijuana smell and that makes people who are coming downtown for games feel unsafe or they just don't like the smell or they don't like the chaos or whatever. I mean, even though we've like semi-legalized it, you're still not supposed to smoke in public. So in that case, it's like people who are breaking the law, albeit in a rather minor way. And the effect is, I don't know, annoying. I just became hyper aware in this conversation that Younger folks listening might be like, what are these two old fogies complaining about? Because when I was in my 20s, if I had heard two people complaining about the smell of weed on the street, I would have been like, oh, get with it, Gramps. Like, what are you like? What a silly thing to complain about. But I do think it doesn't make you sound very cool when you complain about the smell of weed in the city. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be a complaint. The same way it doesn't make you feel very cool to complain about, like, the noise of your neighbors having a party or something. Like, so much of city life, of, like, the governance of a city and of just, like, living in close proximity to your fellow humans is about adjudicating annoying things, right? Adjudicating something that someone else may be into doing that you are not into experiencing. And in some cases, the law needs to do that. And in some cases, sort of, like, social convention and just, like having a code of what makes you like a decent neighbor and fellow human needs to do that. And I think because legal or semi-legal or whatever we want to call it, weed is rather new, the codes haven't quite caught up. And 
the law is a tricky one because, you know, I think whenever you're talking about, you know, using the law to punish or dissuade people from doing something that someone finds annoying, that's obviously going to be selectively enforced, ad hoc. And we know that when things are, sele- are sort of ad hoc enforced, the enforcement tends to land on outgroups. And that's like a dangerous, risky thing. So, you know, in my ideal world, like everyone would just be a decent neighbor and try to like live their best life in a way that's uh, least inconveniencing to the people around them without having to bring in any authorities. But that doesn't always happen. One could hope the dream of city living that everybody just does their own thing and is really thoughtful and conscious of how that thing impacts the people they are sharing space in close proximity with. Although I have to say, speaking of laws needing to catch up, that actually might be happening because the D.C. Council passed emergency legislation that would empower city officials to penalize unlicensed marijuana gifting shops that have not applied to the city's medical cannabis program. So this bill, which would take near immediate effect, would treat those cannabis businesses similarly to how the business treats liquor licenses. And so if you've ever bought weed in D.C., you know what I'm saying, that they, we have this sort of weird gray market where you go in and what you're buying is a notebook. But then the gift that comes free with that notebook that costs $70 or whatever is marijuana. And so what they're saying is that a lot of these stores that do that have not applied for the city's program to, like, register. And so if, according to this legislation... If those gifting outlets have not applied for that program or met the qualifications of that program, they would be subject to civil enforcement. And so there might be some more enforcement coming from the legal side on this soon. Black Cat is a DC icon, and I spent a bunch of my 20s there. These days, it is still rocking and features artists from every genre, many of them you would be hard-pressed to find anywhere else, really. Like Twin Tribes, a self-described dark wave duo that features lyrics about the occult and parallel universes. They're coming to town on April 4th. Where else are you going to see that? Or you could check out Echo Astral on April 5th a new DC-born queer punk band that pioneered what they call mascara mosh pit music. I don't even know what that means. You probably don't either, but I want you to find out. You with me? Also, March 28th, girls' school. Yeah, right. Here's what you do. Go to blackcatdc.com for tickets and the venue's full schedule. Once again, that's blackcatdc.com. Have fun out there. I mean, I find this whole legal regime so embarrassing, right? Like I'm a law-abiding, I think, adult, and I want to buy a thing that is or most people want to be legal. And I have to go into a store and go through this ridiculous, dishonest charade of like, yes, I really want to buy that T-shirt. Oh, thank you for the gift you gave me. (laughs) And it's, you know, it's BS. And, you know, on the one hand... I think whenever there are like dark spaces, whenever there's people who live in the shadows, businesses that operate in the shadows, that allows for sketchy things to happen. So on the one hand, like, you know, good on DC for like bringing this into the light, into the sunlight, so that in theory, you could then have an easier time complaining about the store, which is after all a commercial business, doing something else you don't like. On the other hand, they're not really bringing it into the sunlight, they're bringing it into another lie, which is that now they're part of the quote-unquote medical marijuana program, which has changed from requiring a like formal doctor's note and license and all that to you self-attesting that, like, I think I need this medically, <laughs> which you can't do at a pharmacy. And again, I think, I think it should just be legal, and, and that's that. But the idea of having to go through, like, be basically be dishonest or, like, be janky, like a a situation where people are allowed to be their own medical attester, it's all a result of living in this strange city legal system where they can't do this thing that they want to do because Congress will not let them. It's not that way across the border in Maryland, but that's the sort of situation we're stuck with, and it's not really D.C.'s fault, but it basically creates a culture of, of weirdness. A culture of weirdness. Like, I don't like having to participate in this fiction just to do something that I think I should have the right to do. And I don't like that that is the only way to really participate in it. And I mean, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I 
would prefer if DC had a system that was like up and up, above board, official stores like other states have. I think that this gray market creates a dynamic where it's like, if I had a bad experience at one of these gray market, semi-legal, maybe kind of sketch weed establishments, it doesn't seem like I could have the same mechanisms to like report it or tell somebody. And we're talking about things that people ingest, right? Like a lot of these stores sell mushrooms and things like that. Like we're talking about things that people are consuming and smoking and putting into their body. I don't want things that I have to buy to put into my body to be regulated by a janky ass gray market, right? Like (laughs) I should be able to go to a store like anything else and have the same protections and recourse if that doesn't go well for me. And I guess I should say like, I've definitely had experiences when I was in California that were like the Apple store of weed and like those felt weird in their own way too. I didn't really love the, the vibe of, it's like going in to buy an iPod or an iPhone where they're, it's so slick and shiny. I'm sure those have their own drawbacks, but the system we have now, I don't think is really working. And yeah, I just, I don't love participating in it. Right. This too seems like a kind of hangover from this period of prohibition and like really unjust prohibition and unjust enforcement. If there was any other store selling something you ingest, right? If the orange juice store was telling you like, hey, or- this orange juice, it'll it'll you know cure all of your ailments and it'll make you better and, it'll, and there's nothing possibly wrong with it. You would be like, come on, orange juice guy, like you're you're trying to pull one over on me so you can make more money. But you know, when people express that degree of skepticism towards legal or semi-legal weed or hallucinogens, the vibe is still a lot of like, well, you must be for the drug war then, which is, uh, you know, I, I think the proper stance towards anyone who's selling anything that you eat or drink or put in your body should be of, uh, of skepticism and trying to, you know, make sure we create a system where they can't give us dangerous things, you know, whether yes. that's like burgers with E. coli or anything else. Yes. And it doesn't make you uncool or unhip to say that. That is just like a common sense thing. If we're really going to like get into it, can we talk about how many of these stores there are in the city now? And how, I mean, talk about like petty complaints. There are parts of the city where there are like on one block, multiple smoke shops. I I don't think we need that many. They don't look very nice. Oftentimes I'm I'm like, this is kind of an eyesore. I don't think we need to have that many in a, in a smaller city. I mean, on the one hand, it's up to them, right? Like, if people want to buy that much weed, if these stores can stay in business, then, you know, good for them. Contrast it with liquor. Like, your average bougie person, even if they don't drink a lot, it just sort of feels like like in their house, they wind up amassing a bar, right? With They'll probably have a bottle of vodka somewhere in their house and of whiskey and of tequila and It just happens, right? Because, you know, you have people over once or something, which is just to say there's a lot of booze to buy. There's a lot of varieties of booze to buy, and you're going to want an array of them if you are somebody who serves alcohol. How much weed is there really to buy that props up this many stores? It's just kind of amazing. Yeah, this is where I have to admit something not flattering, which is that when I was younger and I was just starting to get into, like, doing drugs, man, I was definitely that person who, I I guess I participated in weed culture in a way that is really embarrassing to me now because I was young. And so, you know, being excited about different strains and like looking at pictures of weed and being like, oh, this has XYZ hairs or crystals on it. Like there is a whole subculture around it that you can choose to participate in, just like any other kind of hobby that looking back now, I'm like, oh, that's that's a little tedious. Like what a weird thing to participate in. And just to be clear, I, I also cringe at wine aficionados. <laughs> so, I mean, I cringe at most aficionados. So really anybody that's too precious and too pedantic about whatever their little thing is, Mike's not yes. on board. But again, I'm perfectly happy to have them like kind of baffled at the at the number of weed stores. But, you know, good on them if they can make a go of it. I think you're right, though. That sometimes they're they're not so pretty. And you, it's like a prettier <laughs> weed store out there. I don't quite know how we as fellow citizens, either through uh, norms or through the government, can enforce our desire for pretty stores. But that's a different story. Well, it doesn't have to be pretty, but like 
It doesn't have to be an eyesore either. I think there is a way to have it be a happy medium. I'm not needing this to be some bespoke, super classy looking store. But half the time, I feel like they're just like, it's like flashing lights. Neo- like they they must all have like one designer or like hmm. visual artist. It's like, here's what we're going to do. Neon lights everywhere. Flash, make sure they're flashing. It just can be a lot. I remember thinking like, I don't know now that I like the idea of having a 24-hour vape shop slash convenience store in my neighborhood. And I will say, in the years since it's been here, I think that having people come do transactions that involve smoking apparatuses and stuff and selling and buying smoking apparatuses 24 hours a day is a little much. The difference between my block before it opened and after it opened is really stark. So what's the difference? What's happened? Definitely more people, more idling cars. And yeah, it's like, it just also more of a police presence. Like I live on a block that I would say like used to be pretty quiet. Now, I don't mean quiet in a noise way, more just like people would go go about their business. People didn't have reason to stop all types of night. And so because more people are, are coming and hanging out all types of night, police are now parked pretty much right outside my bedroom window late into the night. I think we all as city residents have to put up with a considerable degree of uh, annoyingness happen at hours we don't want. The weird legal situation that is unique to cannabis comes into play is that if you've lived above an Apple store, very few people are going to ever walk in there with cash. But you're living above an establishment, I think, where people have to use cash. And that means that if you are someone who wants to steal cash, it's probably a a place you also want to hang out because you might find some easy marks there. And that is a place where this sort of screwed up national legal situation about this causes more danger than is necessary. Because if it's a all cash business, that means it's a target rich establishment. That means it's a target. That means police want to hang out nearby because police want to maybe protect the target. And all of it leads to these things that you are reacting to. Uh, A very small amount of that has to do with the actual product being sold, and a much larger amount of it has to do, I think, with the kind of lingering legal situation. Oh, I completely agree. And I think any kind of high cash business, I understand, would be like susceptible to this kind of thing. Uh, It really, at that point, it's almost not about the product that they sell. Yeah, it's it's about the kind of transactions that are going down. So all of this to say, I know I sound very like grumpy, complaining about this. I just think that DC could use a better, clearer system. I'm never a fan of gray markets. When people who are not from DC ask me if weed is legal here, I say yes. And then they say, oh, can you buy it in the store legally? And I'm like, uh, and then I have to go into a pretty long, detailed, yeah. complicated explanation. And by the end of it, their eyes are ro- like glazed over and they're like, oh, I'm sorry I asked. And I don't think it needs to be that way. Like, I understand that we are at the behest of Congress, and so it's complicated, but I just don't love the system. I don't think it's serving the city as, as well as it could be. Right. And I, and I think your your bigger point, like whether it's the actual like bureaucratic system of the District of Columbia or culture and folkways and unwritten rules of those of us who live here, it's new and it's kind of working its way through both systems. And maybe you sound like a geezer, but I don't think you're a Karen because I think <laughs> actually, if insofar as like part of it has to do with like, us collectively as the residents of the city deciding on like what our standards are and what our unwritten rules ought to be. It's actually a really good thing to to talk about and maybe help steer us in a better direction. Yes. And I'm glad that you brought that up. Listeners will know that I am, I identify as a proud black Karen. And I think somebody once wrote in and they said that they did not appreciate us using the word Karen because her name is Karen. (laughs) I proudly identify as a Karen and I I don't mean this disparagingly. I think that all of us should be Karens for good. You yeah. don't have to be a Karen for like the server who screws up your coffee order. That's being a Karen for bad. But you can be being a Karen for good and really caring about what happens on your block, what happens in your community from a real place of wanting it to be safe and good for everyone. I don't see anything wrong with that as long as you're like not being nasty about it. So, yeah. I'm sort of the view like, I don't know, asking to talk to the manager is not inherently bad. What's bad is that historically, the feeling that you had the right to talk to the manager was unequally distributed. And and, uh, I'm glad you're speaking up. Yes, we need to have more inclusion 
in terms of who feels like they are entitled to, to talk to the manager. Right. <laughs> Mike, I guess I'll see you at the smoke shop. Uh, you know it. I'll be there at three in the morning, <laughs> idling my car outside. <laughs> you'll you'll see me from just a pair of eyes, angrily peeking at the curtain out at your car. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoy the show, you can get even more great content like this by becoming a member. Just go to membership.citycast.fm. And we'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then. <laughs> <laughs>